All right, hey guys, this is the Bio285 uh, weekly review sessions. Today, Tina and I are gonna cover half of the week three content. So we'll get started and feel free to put questions in the chat or just stop me and Tina at any moment if you have questions about anything. So without further ado, let's start. Oh, you skipped a slide. I'll totally just skipped like three slides. Sorry. You can just do like right. arrow keys. Yeah. So first we're going to talk about where proteins are made. And proteins are made in the cytosol. And we learned this week that the cytosol or cytoplasm contains ribosomes that are involved in translating the protein. And there are two types of ribosomes we discussed. So there's freely floating ribosomes, and then there's ribosomes that are docked onto the, the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. And so depending on what kind of protein you have or where the protein is going to go in the cell, uh, you can have a protein created on either ribosome. Um, and proteins that go enter the endomembrane system are produced by ribosomes that are attached to these uh, docked, or excuse me, proteins that go to the endomembrane system are produced by the ribosomes that are attached to the ER. And these proteins are directly funneled into the ER once as they're being translated. So these proteins include uh, the specific areas such as the ER, and secreted proteins, lysosome proteins, and proteins that go to the Golgi bodies. And then other proteins that don't go through the, through the endomembrane system are made by freely floating ribosomes. And so these ribosomes are not attached to anything. They just kind of float around in the cytoplasm. And examples of these kind of proteins are cytosolic proteins, uh, nuclear proteins, mitochondrial proteins, and then at the bottom there, it's supposed to say chlor chloroplast proteins. Uh, does anyone have any questions on anything I talked about so far? No? Okay. Uh, Tina, you got to go back one. Oh. It's okay. Um, this was the same. Is it the same? Oh. It's this one, I think, yeah. Okay. It's because I'm not clicking, that's why I was just like confused about it. It's all good. Okay. Um, so yeah, just like I discussed, you can see in the photos, you have examples of freely floating ribosomes and those some of those areas that they end up going to. And then you have the membrane bound ribosomes that are docked onto the ER. And yeah, that's just a picture to back up what I had just said. So yeah, you can continue to the next slide. And so I think Laura talked a lot about the endomembrane system. So I just thought I would uh, reiterate the importance of it. So the endomembrane system is considered to be the group of membrane bound organelles that work together to modify, package and transport proteins. And the endomembrane system basically is a huge system that's made of um, organelles that are mostly membrane bound. So these are things like your ER, Golgi bodies, the lysosome and cell membrane. And, the and it also involves like the transport vesicles that move between them. And the way that proteins move through this system, like being able to traffic the proteins through the system or the movement of proteins is called the secretory pathway when they move along this, this area. And just like I said, any protein that functions in these areas or even a protein that has to exit the cell has to pass through the secretory pathway or the endomembrane system. And the endomembrane system always begins in the ER. That's where the protein will first go. And so normally the protein will travel through the ER and then it will go to the Golgi bodies by, by leaving the ER on a secretory vesicle, which I think I'll show in like the next slide, which will make more sense. And then it will move to the Golgi bodies and then it goes off of the vesicle there. And then it will go to a variety of different places depending on where its final destination will be. 
And I thought this was an important point to bring up, but by default, if a protein only has um, ER localization sequence or an ER or like just a regular ER import sequence, it'll continue to travel through the endomembrane system until it gets secreted outside of the cell. Um, and it won't stop unless it has some other signal or a retention signal for the ER or something else. And so, perfect. So this diagram here basically just reiterates like what I was talking about. Tina, do you wanna do like the, like the laser pointer thing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Pointer. So you can see at the, at the very bottom of the screen that the, the ER is the, the purple part that's not, doesn't say nucleus. So that's where the proteins that enter the endomembrane system, that's where they're made on ribosomes that dock the ER and the ribosomes are like the small yellow dots. And then after it's made, the proteins will travel like through the ER until they go onto a transport vesicle, like I was saying earlier, then they go through the Golgi bodies, which is green. And then it'll continue to float until it goes on to another secretory vesicle. And then it will travel out of the cell if it's supposed to be a protein that's destined to go to leave the cell and do work outside of the cell. And yeah, that's just a diagram of endomembrane system. Does anyone have any questions on that? Um, I had a, a quick question about ER localization. Um, mm -hmm. It's like on the previous slide. But when you have um, something that goes to the ER, does that mean that like it has to go all the way through the pathway, even if it doesn't have like a Golgi um, localization or cell membrane localization? So I'll, I'm gonna like go through all of the like signal sequence stuff, but basically like when a protein is supposed to go to the ER and the protein is gonna function in the ER and like it's gonna reside there or live there, quote unquote, that protein will have like an ER import sequence or like it's called the ER localization sequence. But then that protein also has to have a retention sequence, an ER retention sequence, which is what like, make sure that the protein stays in the ER. Otherwise, if it just has the ER localization sequence and no other sequence, it will continue to travel through the endomembrane system. Okay, awesome, thank you so much. So that makes sense? Yeah, a little more now. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. And yeah, I'm gonna bring it up in like the, the slides to come. So I'll definitely make sure it gets cleared, but that's a good clarification question, so thank you. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to talk about how proteins know where to go. Next slide. Thanks, Tina. And so proteins know where to go because they have signal sequences. And signal sequences, I just want you guys to try to think of it as like, like a zip code. Like when you post something in the mail, like a letter or something, you usually put like the address or the zip code. So just try to think of signal sequences kind of like a zip code. It's like a little tag or like zip codes is a few numbers, but for a protein, we're gonna think it's like a tag and it's a like amino acid sequence that's embedded in the protein and it tells the protein where its final destination will be. And the signal sequences are not, are actually built within the protein during translation. So it's not added to the protein after the entire protein has been made. So you, I know you guys discussed what post, I think you guys may have discussed post-translational modifications, right? Does that ring a bell for some people? Anyone in the chat or um, give me a thumbs up if you heard. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so this, so signal sequences are different than post-translational modifications because they're not like a, an extra like chemical group added after the protein has been made. And signal sequences are just like a, a string of amino acids that are built into the protein itself. And so it's kind of woven into its tertiary structure. Um, or actually, excuse me, it's actually like woven into its primary structure so within the sequence of the protein. And um, what else was I gonna emphasize on the slide? Uh, just like the question we had earlier, every time a protein is localized to the ER, it has to have an ER signal sequence. And this is because the ER signal sequence is recognized by, 
signal recognition protocol, or SRP, which binds to the newly made protein and takes it to the ER. So without the ER import sequence, uh, it won't be able to be recognized and it won't make its way into the ER. Um, and if a protein doesn't have an ER signal sequence, then it's not gonna be able to leave this cytosol or if it just like didn't have any sequence, it wouldn't leave the cytosol after it's been translated. And just like I said earlier, any protein that has to be secreted out of the cell uh, must go to the endomembrane system. And one and Laura also emphasized that once proteins leave the ER, that they rarely come back out again. And I don't think I don't think she expects you to know this, but it's just a key point that I had in like in my notes from when I took the class. But the process in which they return is called ERAD, which I forget what that stands for. I think it's like a retro translocation or something like that. Um, yeah, so that's signal sequences. I'm going to talk more about that, but does anyone have any questions on anything I said so far? Okay, I, I'll just continue. And so this diagram is just to accompany the slide before and some of the upcoming slides. Uh, I had this from someone in, in Discord from last semester posted this, but it's essentially like a like sequence map and you can sort of go through it and practice. Like if the protein, does it have an ER signal sequence? And yes, then it's translated on a membrane bound ribosome rather than a free ribosome. And then figuring out like, depending on what sequence it has, where the protein will end up. Um, Laura doesn't really touch on signal anchor sequence. So you don't have to know that, but if you were curious, the signal Anchor sequence is basically for if you have like a transmembrane protein. So a protein that's kind of like um, half out, half in of like a membrane. But yeah, for this class, I don't think she covers signal anchor sequence. But pretty much the other things, um, I think it's like a good diagram to follow. Like if you're trying to figure out whether a protein will end up um, exiting the cell it would have to have an ER sequence and then it would have to flow through the endomembrane system. So it goes through the ER lumen and it goes through the Golgi body via the transport vesicles. And then if it didn't have any other signal, like I said, any other signal sequence, it would end up being secreted from the cell, which is on the right-hand side. Yeah, which is at the bottom there. So yeah, I just thought it would be a useful diagram um, we don't focus on chloroplast proteins in this class, uh, just mostly, I think, mitochondria and nucleus. Um, maybe Golgi. Um, lysosome comes up sometimes, but yeah, you don't need to know chloroplast or like peroxisome. I don't think she goes to those. But um, yeah, does anyone have questions on the diagram or anything I said so far? Okay, we can keep going forward. Thanks. Okay, so more about signal sequences. Uh, like I said, signal sequences essentially target your protein to their final location. And signal sequences act as binding sites for another protein. So I have a diagram here of what is an example of nuclear import. And you have your cargo protein or your newly translated protein which is in like the gold. Tina, do you wanna do like the pointer thing again? I just yes. have the pointer thing. Yeah. yeah, so it's like the golden, it's the golden protein, it's up in the left. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, so that's like your newly made protein and you're trying to bring it to the nucleus. So what happens is when the protein is translated, it has the signal sequence, which is the nuclear localization sequence that appears on the surface of the protein. And so it acts as a binding site because Importin will recognize that sequence and it binds to it, which is shown there. And it will actually pull the protein through the nuclear pore complex into the nucleus. And yeah, that's what we mean when we say that signal sequences can act as binding sites for other proteins. And proteins normally, most of the time, will enter organelles unfolded. And the only exception to this rule is really the nucleus. Because as you can see, the protein that was being taken into the nucleus 
it was not like unraveled, like it's in its full, um, it's in its full tertiary structure, and it wasn't like um, unraveled and then rebuilt inside the organelle by chaperone proteins, which is a common thing that is done with, I believe, ER proteins and mitochondria. So yeah, so as you can see, the protein maintains its structure, it gets pulled into the nucleus. And the reason why the nuclear proteins are not, um, do not enter the organelle fully folded and fully made instead of being unraveled like the other, like some of the other organelles is because the nuclear uh, pore complex and the localization of proteins within the nucleus is a heavily regulated process and the nuclear pores are able to accommodate for the size of proteins, so they're able to make room and sort of squeeze them through. And that's why proteins are able to enter the nucleus fully folded and fully made, I think is the expression that Laura uses. And yeah, so like I was saying before, um, that's contrast to the ER and the mitochondria because um, the because the proteins that enter there are kind of unraveled, kind of like spaghetti, and then uh, they're, they're helped to refold themselves like within the organ. And I think I'm gonna discuss this again in the upcoming slide, but once a protein enters the, sorry, Tina, can you go back? Oh, sorry, yeah. Okay. Once a protein enters the ER of mitochondria, uh, the N-terminal sequence on the, in its primary structure gets cleaved so that it doesn't exit the organelle. And that's because uh, the N-terminus is where you find the signal sequence. So that specific um, sequence of amino acids and it gets, so those, those amino acids get cleaved off once it enters the ER or once it enters the mitochondria so that it doesn't exit back out. And yeah, you can go to the next slide. Now, does anyone have any questions on anything I said so far? Okay, so yeah, once again, this is just like another diagram. I like to include diagrams because I think they're helpful, but it's pretty much like the concept map you saw before. Um, it shows you that the proteins that are translated on freely floating ribosomes, um, they start in the cytosol because that's where those ribosomes are and then they end up in those different locations. Um, and then proteins that go through the endomembrane system or go anywhere else are translated on the membrane bound ribosomes on, that are docked onto the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And yeah, that's the diagram. You can go to the next slide, thanks. Thanks, Dina. No problem. Um, and so this slide here is just sort of a summary of stuff I described so far. Um, people have different learning styles. So some people like to see like all the text written out on the slide. Some people like diagrams, some people like the charts. So I just figured I'd put the chart that sort of summarizes um, most of the key similarities and differences. So as you can see in the nucleus, the signal sequence stays on the protein the entire time. It does not get cleaved. And that's different than ER proteins and mitochondrial proteins because the signal sequence becomes cleaved by a special protein called a signal peptidase after it enters that specific organelle. Uh, something I said before is that most of the time signal sequences are embedded into the primary structure of a protein, which means that while the protein is being synthesized or translated, the signal sequence is being like, added to the protein. Um, and that's true of the ER and the mitochondria because the signal sequences are located in the N-terminus, which if you guys remember from week one, the N-terminus is like the beginning end of the protein or the beginning end of the polypeptide chain, excuse me. So yeah, that's why the signal sequence is embedded into the primary structure and specific, more specifically the N-terminus of the polypeptide chain and it contrasts to that with the nuclear proteins um, because the signal sequence is part of the folded structure of the protein. So it's on the exterior surface, so the tertiary structure of that protein. Uh, and that makes sense because 
I explained earlier how uh, for proteins that go to the nucleus, the signal sequence, which is on the exterior, on the surface of the protein, is recognized by an origin, which will bind to that sequence and bring that target protein into the nucleus. So that's why that makes sense. And let me see. And so like I was saying before, I just figured I'd say it again so that it makes a bit more sense, but proteins enter the nucleus fully folded and fully made because they're able to squeeze through the nuclear pore complex. And that's separate from the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria because in that process, the protein sort of unravels like spaghetti and it enters the organelle unfolded. And then once it gets inside the organelle, the signal sequence is clipped. And then the special chaperone proteins help that special protein to refold back to its original shape. And yeah, and then one more thing is that, I think I said this already, but signal sequence for your nuclear proteins is found on the exterior surface. Whereas for um, the ER and mitochondria, the signal sequence is located in the N terminus and it's part of the proteins, I'd say it's part of the proteins primary structure. Yeah, so that's just a summary of what, what I was saying before. So does anyone have any questions on that so far? Let me check the chat. No, no questions, okay. And yeah, this is just um, more diagrams, because why not? Uh, I just think diagrams are a good way to learn stuff. Uh, once you see it like a few times in picture form, I think it makes a bit more sense and it helps put the words into perspective. So yeah, just like I was saying before, you see on the left here, we have a ER protein. And so like while the protein is being synthesized on the membrane of the uh, rough ER, it's being pulled through into the ER lumen. And once it enters the ER, there's a signal peptidase enzyme or just like a special protein that cleaves that, that cleaves the signal sequence off of the N terminus. And then you see how it's kind of entering the, the ER like spaghetti, it's entering unfolded. So then once it gets inside the ER, there's special chaperone proteins, which you guys learned about, I think last week. Um, and the chaperone proteins will help that protein uh, assist it in its folding so it can fold to the correct shape back into its tertiary structure. And yeah, on the right hand side, there's the mitochondrial protein. And so similar to the ER protein, it'll enter the organelle unfolded. And then once it is inside, it gets cleaved by a special protein. And then there's chaperone proteins. I don't, it's not labeled there, but they're there to help refold it. And yeah, that's just words into pictures. So hopefully that makes sense. And again, just feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Cool. So now I'm gonna talk about signal sequences, the sort of like the chemistry of them. Um, they're just like general trends within the signal sequences. So normally for uh, signal sequences for the ER or ER localization, ER import sequences, you'll find the signal sequence for that protein will be on the end terminus, so at the beginning of the polypeptide chain. And they're normally hydrophobic amino acids followed by interspersed charged R groups. Um, and that's, it's like a specific, it has to be a specific chemistry so that the SRP can bind to that signal sequence and bring the protein into the organelle. And uh, things to keep in mind for the ER is that if you want a protein to be localized to the ER, you want the ER to be its final destination, that protein has to have an import sequence or ER localization sequence import to ER sequence, and then it has to have, it has to have two sequences. So the import to ER sequence and the ER retention signal sequence. And actually the ER retention signal sequence is found at the C terminus. So when the, when uh, protein is localized to the ER, uh, the, and the, the protein will go into the 
to the ER and then the end terminus is cleaved. The end terminus ER import sequence is cleaved. And then um, the rest of the chain gets read, the polypeptide chain gets read and they see the, they can be seen, the ER retention sequence can be seen in the C terminus. And that's how the protein is able to remain in the ER and not get kicked out or go through the endovenous system. And so, yeah, it's very important that you know that it has to have both sequences. So sometimes she likes to ask like problem set questions or even I think I had an exam question that where would a protein end up if you had an ER import sequence? And so like the answer to that would be the, would be like, well, it just has an ER import sequence. Like it could go through the endomembrane system. Or actually, I think the question was like, if a protein just has an ER retention sequence, like where would it end up? And like the answer would be the cytosol because you can't have a protein go going to the ER if it doesn't have like the ER localization sequence or the ER import sequence. And so like the ER retention sequence would kind of just be like invalid. It wouldn't, it would be like read by the, it would be recognized, but there's nothing like you can do with that if it's in the cytosol. So it has to have the import to ER to get inside the ER in the first place, and then the ER retention sequence for it to stay in the ER. And yeah, and uh, mitochondria, usually the signal sequences are positively charged, polar positively charged amino acids at the end terminus. And oh, I forgot to mention earlier, but you guys don't have to like memorize what the chemistry of the signal sequences are. Um, it's just like, these are just trends within the signal sequences to keep in mind. Um, but she doesn't expect you like to memorize like the amino acids that are in the signal sequences. But if she gives you, like sometimes I think she's asked before maybe on like problem sets or something, like if you have um, like positive polar, positively charged like amino acids, like what signal sequence could this be? And then like you could like look at your notes and say that it was like the mitochondria or something like that. And there's a slide that has like a picture of it. So that, and that was like part of your notes. So like you don't have to memorize the specific chemistry of it, but they're just like trends because each of the signal sequences are unique. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'm gonna say for the types, the chemistry within the signal sequences. Um, and for the nucleus, you can see that like they don't have like a specific chemistry that's needed for the signal sequences, like specific types of amino acids. Um, yeah, it's just important that the signal sequence appears on the exterior surface of the protein for import and export, and that signal sequence doesn't get cleaved off. And then an important point I thought I'd make is that the cytosol doesn't have any signal sequence because um, that's where proteins are made. So proteins are made, uh, they're made on a freely floating ribosome and that's the ribosome lives in the cytosol or the cytoplasm. So if it, like if once the protein is made, it can just float in the cytosol, if it has nowhere to go. So, and usually proteins that lack signal sequences end up being there. Um, so I know that was a lot, but does anyone have any questions on anything I said? No? I also wanted to um, add something really quick. Sure. The, um, I know that in, I believe it was this week's problem set, but for maybe the first question or such, it talked about a transmembrane domain. And um, some people reached out to me saying that they didn't really understand what that was. So when you have like the ER import sequence and then it gets to the ER, or if it wants to stay in the ER, it has the ER retention sequence, like um, Michelle just said. But if it were to, um, if you wanted that protein or that signal to stay um, in embedded within the ER membrane, that's what that transmembrane domain is for. So you can imagine that if you didn't have the transmembrane domain, it would just be floating around in the, um, the ER lumen. So I thought that was helpful. Thanks. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, let me skip some slides. Yeah, so this was basically what I was trying to get at before. This is just showing you that uh, signal sequences, depending on where the protein is going, they're unique in their chemistry. 
And that's pretty important because like we said, like some signal sequences act as binding sites for other proteins. So um, if the signal sequence is off by a few amino acids or if you mutate a signal sequence, there's a chance that the protein might not be able to get to its destination. Like if you um, uh, threw out some of the hydrophobic amino acids in the ER signal sequence and you swap them out for polar amino acids, then you might cause problems for the protein because it won't get recognized by SRP and the protein won't get brought to the ER. Uh, the mutations can cause issues like that. Um, but yeah, I just figured I'd include this diagram. I think she includes it in her lectures, but yeah, it's just uh, something you can refer to and you can see that signal sequences are unique and they're important so that proteins get trafficked to the right place. Is this the next slide? Like, yeah. Oh, okay. Because I think this um, after yeah, it this is. it goes into like uh, hormone secretion and such. Cool. Okay. Um. So yeah, I just thought I'd throw in a practice problem for you guys to try. If you want to give it a try, you can do the next. All right. So I'm actually, not sure if this is your problem set. Probably not, because my office hours are Friday. So. Um. But yeah, so the question says, transmembrane proteins must have an ER import sequence on their N-terminus. Predict where you'd find a membrane receptor protein, basically just the, the fancy way of saying transmembrane protein. If you engineered its gene such that you removed the ER, uh, removed the ER import se sequence, assuming that your protein does not completely misfold or get degraded, where will your receptor end up? And just to emphasize the transmembrane protein, the membrane that it's spanning is the, the ER membrane. So I'll give you guys a minute or two to try and see if you can figure out the answer. And if you want, you can put it in the chat or just unmute and say what you think the answer would be. Now this question isn't exactly like the problem set question, but um, very similar. And a lot of exams usually have um, like this type of question that Laura is gonna ask. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this was my exam question like two years ago. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, if you guys want to give it like a, a moment just to think it through, just just try to use like the concepts based off like what you know about signal sequencing and specifically like with the ER, the mechanism of that to try and see if you can answer the question. And I'll give you guys like a few minutes just to think about it. But does anyone have any idea or anyone think they know where it is? Um, would you have a retention se uh, sequence or no? Yeah, so that's actually a good point. So for this specific, in this scenario, for this question, they're just telling us that it's a transmembrane protein and that um, for for transmembrane proteins like to work properly, it has an ER import sequence on the N-terminus. And so in this situation, we've just removed the ER import sequence. So it's like the ER, the ER import sequence that normally would bring a protein into the ER. So that's been like genetically modified or removed. So that's, that's the only information that they're giving you in the question. I guess what I'm trying to say is you just go off the information that's specifically in the question. I don't know if that made sense. If I just confuse you more, I can't tell. Uh, I don't know. I guess I'm trying to compare it to the our problem set question as well. Sorry. Um, All right, let me see. Someone says something in the chat. Okay, don't compare it to the problem set because this is different. This is a different situation. Um, end up in the cell membrane. Um, not quite. So this is kind of difficult, but let me see if I can try and explain. So just try not to think about the problem set. Just try to think about just this example question. So here they're telling us in the question, 
that it's like absolutely necessary or like the protein needs to have an ER import sequence on the N terminus for it to be able to like have a characteristic of the transmembrane protein. So like that's that's just like the statement in the beginning that the problem is telling us. And then it's a and so then the problem is saying that that they take the ER import sequence that is necessary for this protein to function as a transmembrane protein and they cut it out of the sequence. So they just take the the ER import signal sequence or like those sequence of amino acids and they just remove it completely, which would mean that it would not be able to do its job as a transmembrane protein. So if you were, if you were to remove that sequence, um, where do you guys think like it would end up? I don't know if that helped or if that just like made things worse. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Cytosol. Yeah. Oh, cytosol. Someone got it. Yes. Two people. Yay. Cytosol. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Good job. Okay. Wait, Tina. I was gonna have to Oh, that. sorry. <laughs> All right. You guys. Two. Okay. Most. I think a few of you have it. So, let me think. Can anyone explain why? Now Tina's shown us the answer. <laughs> Can anyone explain why? Why do you think it's- I know what's all. That's okay. You guys saw like 0.5 of a second of it. But no, that's okay. It's okay. Um, the question is hard to interpret. I feel like the way it was written was kind of weird. So that's my fault on that. But okay. You guys who said cytosol, can someone, someone brave enough to tell me, like unmute themselves and tell me why you think it was cytosol or put it in the chat? Because it's important that you guys like, like understand how you got there? Um, well, the one like localization signal kind of signal sequence like was removed and when it doesn't have any signal sequence it ends up in the cytosol. Fantastic, that's good. That's a good answer. Okay, now Tina, you can show me. <laughs> Perfect, okay. So that protein will end up in the cytosol. And I'm so sorry, I just can't tell who spoke because I don't have like the little, um, like little pixels of like participants. So I can't see like what, what person spoke. Was it, was it Haley? I just can't tell. Or it was Haley, okay. Was Thanks Haley. Yeah. I wanted to like yeah. say good job, but I can tell who spoke. Okay, so Haley's correct. You'd find it in the cytosol. And this is because if, like the mechanism of ER localization itself, like the ER signal sequence or the ER import sequence is recognized by this special uh, molecule of the SRP, which is what is, which is, which binds to the signal sequence and recruits it into the ER. So based on that mechanism, if you cut out that special sequence that is supposed to get, this normally gets recognized and allows the protein to enter the ER, then you don't have that mechanism anymore. You kind of just prevent that protein from getting into the ER because it can't be recognized by the SRP. Um, and so because it will never even make its way to the ER or touch the ER, then it can't do its function and become a transmembrane protein. Um, and so without the ER signal or any other kind of signal sequences, it's basically as good as like a cytosolic protein without like any sequences at all. So the, the receptor or like the protein in this case would end up floating in the cytosol. And so I put like an analogy in here just to see if you guys could understand uh, so that like it like makes it make more sense, but essentially like the ER proteins, like they rely on the help of this SRP, which um, like takes the protein and brings it towards its final destination. And like the SRP recognizes the specific sequence as a binding site so that it can bring that protein to its place. So uh, an analogy I put was kind of like when you, when you go to get an Uber ride, probably not now, it doesn't make sense with COVID and whatnot, but just think back to a world when we didn't have COVID. But when you go to get an Uber ride, I'm sure most of you have gone at least one, but when you go to get an Uber ride, you use the app on your phone 
and you alert the driver of your location. And so somehow, I don't know if it's like location services or GPS signaling or whatnot. So um, somehow you alert the driver of your location using the app. And so like wherever your phone is, like they use that signal from the phone to come and get you or pick you up from the car. So basically with the scenario here, I was just trying to reiterate that if you don't alert the driver of your location using the GPS signaling through the app or the location services, then they'll never find you and transport you to where you want to go. So this is basically the same thing as the signal sequence because there was no signal sequence on this protein that's destined to go to the ER. So it can be recognized by the signal recognition particle and the signal recognition particle will never be able to pick up the protein and take it to its destination. So can anyone give me like a thumbs up or something in the chat that like that makes sense to the analogy? Does it make sense to people? Like do you guys understand a little bit more now why it's the cytosol? All I need is just one person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah you're good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, actually, I wasn't sure if it was in your problem set or not because the problem sets, like, they switch up every so often. But um, yeah, transmitting from proteins are, like, a real thing. They're not, like, a fictitious problem thing. They're real things that will get you when we talk about pathways. So I'm not gonna fill your head with nonsense now about pathways, but this is just an example of a pathway which you'll learn about soon. Um, so yeah, you can continue, Tina. Thank you. Um, okay. Tina, you can you got the next part, right? You you can do the yes. next part. You guys have heard me talk for too long, so <laughs> I can take over ahead. now. Yeah, give you a break. Um, so we're just gonna go on to secretory pathways now. So the way that things are secreted out. Um, and I feel like a lot of times that when you learn these things, um, it's almost like fictitious ideas of like what occurs, but this is a, insulin is a um, real example of protein sorting and protein trafficking and how um, this hor these hormones get secreted out of the cell and to where they need to go. Uh, so this diagram is an example of a hormone passing through the endomembrane system. Um, so over here, this first part, you have the mRNA with the hormone, pre-hormone being attached to it. Um, and then it has its signaling se sequence so that it binds to the ER and then it gets located into the ER lumen. From there, it has um, another sequence to continue on, like that move on sequence that Laura likes to call it, um, to continue beyond the ER membrane. But before that, an enzyme in this case actually cleaves off this signal sequence. Um, so then it's now called a pro-hormone. And then the, this pro-hormone gets put into a transport vesicle to then move on to the Golgi complex or the Golgi body. Um, and then along the way, this pro-hormone gets kind of like chopped up into little pieces so that they get um, these, this active hormone site gets put out. And then that active hormone is what gets put into the secretary vesicle and then to um, the extracellular space via exocytosis so that the, um, the active hormone gets to the target, gets to where it needs to go wherever throughout the body. Oh, I was going to say real quick, just to add, you guys don't have to memorize like the labels and names of stuff. This is just, you know, glancing at some real life example of protein sorting like Tina. Yes, said. exactly. Just to give you like a concept of how this stuff actually works in our body. And this is just another example um, of a real life example that protein trafficking going protein trafficking goes through. Um, this is an example of a lysosome. In this case, this is the carbohydrate in which the lysosome is, you, um, is involved in waste removal. So the heart carbohydrate inside this vesicle goes through the endomembrane system. So this is the Golgi network. Um, and then it passes through the Golgi to go into where the recept, um, oh, this receptor is recycled, but then here's the carbohydrates still as the waste. And then 
it continues on onward um, in this lysosome now so that it can um, be secreted or be um, disposed of as needed. But that's just another example of something in real life. I wanted to add, sorry. Yeah. I have so much to add. No, it's all good. <laughs> Uh, just so you guys know, like this is an example of endomembrane system, and this this is a protein. Enzymes are proteins, okay? So this is a protein, and the its destination is the lysosome, but because um, it goes through the endomembrane system, it has like ER import sequence, and then it would probably have like a lysosomal sequence, and it wouldn't have an ER retention sequence because remember it's continuing through the endomembrane system, so this specific enzyme would have lysosomal sequence, be lysosomal retention sequence, and um, we are in point, I believe. Cool. You can continue, thanks. Thank you. Um, so before we go on to nuclear import and export, where does anyone have questions about secretion so far or protein trafficking in general? I can't see the chat, so I have no idea, but I'm guessing no. You're good. I All right, no so nuclear import and export. Um, to start off, um, because it's run by GTPases, uh, to give you a little background on what GTPase is, it's actually a super family, like this just big family of proteins. It's not exactly just one thing, but in our case, nuclear import and export is regulated by a specific GTPase called RAN, which is a protein. Um, and then all GTPases are proteins, but not all proteins are GTPases, that kind of idea. So a RAN is a member of the super family of GTPases. And if you look at this picture here, this is just an example picture of um, a bunch of different uh, proteins under the superfamily. Um, all of these are just showing you like how large this family is. So all of them are proteins, but again, not all proteins are GTPases. There are other groups of proteins. Um, but one of Rand's siblings is a protein called RAS, which you might remember from like kinase cascades or other um, signaling pathways if you learned it from bio 151. If you don't remember it though, don't stress yourself out. Um, I think in a couple of weeks or or so that will be going through signal and transduction pathways. So you'll definitely be, definitely be reacquainted with that soon. Oh, so then I have one more thing to add. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so don't get overwhelmed by all the names and the super family. No one's expecting you to memorize it. I never had to memorize it. I'm sure Tina didn't have to. Yes, do not, not to memorize it. it. Yeah, and I wanted to add as well, that anytime you see the, I think that's called suffix. Anytime you see the suffix like ASE on the end of anything, just think of enzymes. That's normally like, like a clue that something is an enzyme. And yeah, proteins can be enzymes as well. So GTPase is an enzyme and a protein. And yeah, that's all I have to say. Good point, thank you. Yeah. All right, so GEFs and GAPs um, to go over these because these are a big part of um, nuclear import and export, they have a big, they play a big role. So to explain what they are, GEFs and GAPs are proteins um, that regulate the RAS family of GTPases. So a GEF stands for guanine nucleotide exchange factor, which is really convenient because you can think of it as its job to exchange GDP to GTP. And how it does that is through a conformational change at the GTPase active site. So essentially what this means is that um, GTPase will initially be bound to GDP and then it'll go through a GEF will help, um, when, when GEF comes along, it'll cause a conformational change between GTPases and then that decreases the affinity that GTPase has for GDP. So then that just means this speaks to the whole structure, equal, um, structure equals function. So when the conformational change decreases the affinity, GDP leaves GTPase. And then since there's a lot of GTP around just nearby, um, now 
there's an available space at the GTPA's active site for GTP to come and bind. And then now with GTP, the GTPA's in our case RAS is, or in our case RAN is active. And then it does its job in the nucleus and the end result, what you um, is most important is that GEF causes GT, GDP to go into GTP. So that end result is that GTPase is bound to GTP. Did that make sense? Or anyone have questions? I know it's just, it's like a tongue twister saying all these letters. I was gonna add something real quick. Yeah, um, of course. When we say like decreases affinity, you can just think of it as like, like, um, well, you'll see when we get to nuclear import export, that's like the next slide pretty much. But um, when we talk about this protein REN or this GTPase, um, when REN is active during the nuclear import, um, it's when it's active in its active state is bound to GTP and how it's able to get bound to GTP is through the help of the GEF. So the GEF will um, bind to REN and then uh, decreasing its affinity is like another word for helping RAN to drop GDP or like let's go of GDP. And then because GTP is more abundant in, inside the cell, like there's just more GTP molecules floating around. Um, once the RAN drops the GDP, then GTP can go into the binding pocket of RAN. And so that causes RAN to become active. That's why we say end result where in GTPase is bound to G GTP and it becomes in its active state. Yeah. All right, thank you. And then on to GAP, um, which is kind of like the opposite of G of GEF. Um, this stands for GTPase activating protein. Um, and then it does the opposite of GEF. So whereas GEF will exchange the GDP to GTP, um, GAP will hydrolyze, or actually GTPases are able to hydrolyze GTP on their own. So to go from a triphosphate to a diphosphate, but with GAP, um, since GTPase does it too slow on its own, GAP will help increase the rate of hydrolyzation so that the whole process as a whole occurs faster. So it will, GAP will go in and help GTPase hydrolyze GTP to GDP faster. Um, and then now that'll make the GTPase inactive. And then this occurs in the cytosol. So the end result of GAP is that the GTPase is now back to being bound to GDP. Any questions so far about GEFs and GAPs? No, okay, sounds good. Okay, so nuclear import. Um, essentially, nuclear import is when you have this, um, you have this cargo protein that needs to get inside the nucleus for whatever job it needs to do. So it'll start with the protein binding to, um, oh, the protein has a NLS, which is a um, the sequence that will allow the sequence that allows it to bind important so that that's what caused that's what tells the cell that it needs to get into the nucleus and so it the NLS binds to the important and then this complex now is able to pass through the pore the NPC the nuclear pore um, into inside the nucleus. So as you can see now it's inside the nucleus. And over here, this is what we just talked about where RAN starts off by being bound to GDP and then GEF comes in to exchange the GDP for GTP. And again, remember that it does so by basically letting go of GDP. And then GTP is just around in the cell and the nucleus in abundance a lot more so it is ready to come in and fill any empty RANs that it sees. Um, so then that's how GTP binds in. This causes um, a conformational change that allows the cargo to be released into this nucleus. So now the cargo goes and does what it needs to do and the important is bound to that RAN GTP. And then 
this entire complex is then cycled back out of the nucleus because re remember that these um, importance are recycled throughout the whole time. Um, they're not remade in abundance or anything. Um, they're used and recycled within the cell. And so in order for the important to be let go of this complex so that it can be used again, that's where the gap comes in and it helps the RAN hydrolyze GTP to GDP. This is that extra phosphate that gets hydrolyzed out. And then this conformational change releases the important so that the cycle continues and that the important binds the cargo and so on and so forth. Any questions about nuclear import? Is there anything in the chat, Michelle? No, nothing in the chat. All right. Okay, cool. So on the flip side of nuclear import, we have nuclear export, which is essentially where there's something inside the nucleus and then that has to come out of the nucleus into the cytosol, into the cell um, and beyond. So we start off with um, the help of GEF. As we can see here, the GDP is released so that GTP comes in and binds. And now this is this complex, this RAN GTP is active. And then being in this active form, it is able to bind export in to its active site. And then the cargo protein with the NES signaling sequence that tells it that it wants to leave the nucleus, it can bind to the export in. And then now you have this complex as a whole where you have the GTP, the exportin, and the cargo protein all together. And so these three molecules come out to exit through the NPC again, through the nuclear pore. And we want everything to be released so that one, the cargo can go off to do what it needs to do, um, do its job, and that the exportin can be reused and recycled. So that happens again through the help of GAP, which will help speed up the process of hydrolyzing GTP. This phosphate comes out from that hydrolysis. It's now GDP. And then the cargo is released into the cytosol to go to its target. And the export in will go back in through the NPC, the nuclear port, um, back inside the nucleus to be reused again as needed. Any questions about nuclear export? All right. Well, um, I know that Laura always mentions too as well that there are, are some people ask as well if there's any way for RAN GDP to get back into the nucleus since it you need to start off with GDP. Um, and Laura has always mentioned that there is a way. Um, we just, if that's kind of like outside the scope of the class though. Um, so you just need to know that there is a way that it gets back into this um, into the nucleus, but you don't really need to know the specifics of that. But yeah, if there aren't any questions, that is the end of our presentation. Thank you guys for coming and attending. And of course, feel free to reach out to either Michelle or I um, anytime with any questions that you might have.